it's so nice to meet you. Um, we can, I guess, get started with the, with the questions. Um, so first of all, like the work that you're doing is really, really awesome at the intersection of machine learning and data science um, with inequality. And um, you recently published a large scale analysis of racial disparities in policing, which is super relevant right now. And so would you mind talking a little bit about your work and sort of why you decided to work on these issues? Yeah, I mean, the policing project, it's joint work with an enormous and interdisciplinary team. So it's, you know, it's drawing on people with backgrounds in computer science, journalists, et cetera. Um, I got involved in the project about five years ago. Uh, and the basic idea is, you know, it was a huge data collection effort where these sort of hero journalists sent out requests for data to more than 100 police departments over the course of five years. And then the data all comes pouring in. And then we sort of the computational folks uh, put it into standardized form and release the data. And we analyzed it to look at evidence of racial discrimination, um, which indeed we found. And I can talk more about that if it's of interest. Um, I think the real strengths of the project are first that it made this data available so you could really analyze, you know, on large scale, these systematic patterns in policing, which is essential to kind of making the situation better. Um, and, and that was that was never possible to do on this scale before. What was compelling to me about the project was, you know, when they did bring me on board, I sort of started taking a preliminary look at some of the statistics and they were really I mean, they were shocking. They were they were frightening the extent of racial disparities, the you know, the massive disparities, for example, in search rates, how likely you are to be searched after a stop on their own, uh, you know, they were much higher for non-white drivers than for white drivers. That on its own isn't proof of discrimination, but if you look deeper in the data, you find evidence of discrimination, and that was very troubling to me. And obviously this year, you know, it's kind of entered the popular consciousness to a greater degree, um, but, you know, the signs have been there for much longer than this year, of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, and sort of like along those lines, like what has inspired you to go into this line of questioning? You know, you mentioned that you've been working on this for five years. What was the inspiration uh, going of, in? Of policing specifically or looking at inequality more broadly? Uh, probably the latter more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I've, I've been interested in inequality since before I started grad school. I think a lot of it was informed um, by my experiences as, as, as a woman and sort of, at, and initially I was interested in sexism. Uh, and then it was kind of like, well, you know, my experiences as a, as a, you know, sort of upper class white woman are not, not descriptive of all the inequalities in the world. So I got interested in racial and socioeconomic and other types of inequalities. I think, you know, today being election day, it does bear mentioning that I do think a, a major inspiration for, for a lot of my research has been President Trump and his election, um, because I think he epitomizes and sort of exacerbates all the fault lines, all the inequalities in American society, right? You have this man who, you know, is racist, who has assaulted dozens of women, who has failed to pay taxes in spite of the fact that he's a billionaire. Like, he really hits every dimension of inequality. He's, he's such a potent metaphor. And so I think, you know, seeing that happen as a young PhD student, it, it did make me even more interested in inequality than I already was. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. And as you said, it's very, it's very relevant today. Um, and so, you know, as you were looking at these issues, and you became interested in it, um, how did you see machine learning and data science being well positioned to address these issues? Yeah, um, in a lot of cases, the questions we're seeking to answer, you know, is there racial discrimination in policing? How does socioeconomic segregation work? These are, these are classic questions, they're old questions. Um, but often the data that is available is new and of a scale and complexity that was not previously available. So you see this in particular, you know, another domain where I'm very interested in inequality is healthcare. Uh, and healthcare, you know, the size of the data sets and the complexity, you know, you've got genomic data, you've got EHR data, you've got imaging data, you've got terabytes or petabytes of data, multimodal data, so like different types of data. And like, it's just obvious, you're never going to make sense of this without a computer. Um, and this is sort of a universally accepted thing. And so you know, we, it's just very clear that if you want to sort of get signal from all these noise and, 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 and come up with new answers to old questions, you're going to need statistical and computational approaches to make sense of them. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's certainly universally recognized among computer scientists, but I think domain experts as well, you know, doctors, lawyers, et cetera, are recognizing that we need to form these interdisciplinary collaborations um, to make sense of this. 
yeah, I think that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I guess like, how have you seen it evolve over the time that you've been working on it, like the computational aspects, as well as um, the work that, uh, just like sort of the work that you've been doing and what have the challenges been um, as you've been working um, within this field? Yeah, so, well, okay. So I think one thing that's happened is we have access to new computational tools that we did not have before. So, you know, for example, as an undergrad at Stanford, I didn't take any deep learning classes. I don't know when I first fit, you know, any kind of deep learning model, but like now you can't get out of Stanford undergrad without taking like 43,000 deep learning classes. Um, and so, you know, so that, that's one thing that's evolved. Um, I think another thing that's evolved is, you know, computer scientists are increasingly recognizing like we need to be thinking about the social implications of our work, uh, about the ways we can exacerbate inequality, about the fact that like, just because we have these predictive superpowers that doesn't necessarily translate into beneficial social outcomes. And so there's that increasing awareness. There's also the recognition that we need to be working with domain experts. You know, we need to be collaborating closely with, you know, whatever, doctors, economists, sociologists, to understand the broader implications of our work. Because if you're just sort of fitting predictive models on retrospective data, sort of divorced from real world context, you're gonna make all kinds of mistakes. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. And I think that's becoming a much bigger issue in, in AI as, as you know, people are starting to recognize this. Um, do you think it's being recognized sort of universally or do you think like, I guess, like, what is, what do you think is the current state of how people are perceiving like maybe like fair and uh, fair AI and how is it um, maybe like how many people do you think or what is the percentage of people you think who are like actually recognizing this and how much work do you think has left to be done? In the AI community, you're saying specifically? In the AI community, because I guess it's like they're the people who are really looking at uh, how do we how do we fit these models in a way that takes into account all of the biases and other things that um, we're we're starting to look at more closely. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's a little hard for me to answer because I have an enormously biased sample, right? Like the people I talk to tend to be like very woke and very thoughtful people. And so like, you know, and if, if they think that like fairness research is a total waste of time, they're probably not talking to me anyway. So it's a little difficult for me to assess. Um, I will say for what it's worth that I'm optimistic that the community is very interested in these issues, in fairness issues. Um, you know, you've seen an enormous growth of the number of publications. Like, I don't know what the graph would look like, but it would certainly be super linear. Maybe it would be exponential, you know, in terms of the number of fairness publications in, in recent years. Um, that's not to say that the problems are, are all solved. I mean, if you look at the fairness literature, you know, I think there's still a lack of consensus about like, okay, so like, what should we actually do? But there's at the very least a recognition that you know, these issues of like, my algorithm is not performing equitably across groups. That's a real issue. It's not something to be brushed under the table. And like, we, we should be thinking about these things. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's good to hear. It's good to hear that there's more work being done. Um, and so you're mentioning sort of like the challenges of um, working towards more fair algorithms. But in terms of like the challenges that exist in your field, do you think it's more on like the algorithmic uh, sort of like the mathematical side or do you think it's more when actually being applied to the domain um, the domain uh, that you're focusing on? I think okay so the general challenge is there's a big gap between getting good predictive performance on a retrospective data set and actually making people's lives better um, and 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 that gap is caused by things that are both mathematical uh, and non-mathematical also you know for example there are mathematical challenges involved in understanding how a neural net is making the predictions that it's making, right? And there are mathematical tools that are addressed, address, you know, that are addressed specifically at this. Like, how can I understand the features it's picking up on? How can I understand uh, if it's picking up on, on spurious confounds, stuff like this. Um, but I think, you know, there are also non-mathematical challenges. Like, for example, I'm fitting this algorithm on a data set. What are the, you know, sort of social and political forces that produced this data set? How might it be biased? You know, let me talk about the historical context that underlies this data. Um, you know, if I'm suggesting some kind of algorithmic intervention, um, how can I think about the actual impacts of that intervention? Do I need to you know, for example, if humans are working with the algorithm, do I need to be talking to, you know, sociologists or psychologists or whatever? So I think in general, some of these challenges are mathematical and some, some of them are non-mathematical, but all of them are pointed at the problem of how do I close the gap between theoretically useful on retrospective data and practically actually impacting people's lives. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and you mentioned like, I guess like context around data. Could you elaborate, or like historical context around data, could you elaborate a little bit more on that point? What does that mean and like, why is it so prudent? Yeah, well, for example, one thing people often talk about is like, you know, what features are acceptable to use um, in, a, in a predictive algorithm? Like if your algorithm is clearly getting signal from some feature, um, should, should you be worried about that or not? And so understanding sort of the, the forces that produce that feature um, are very relevant. So an example, for example, in policing is arrests. You know, we worry about like, you know, if someone has a bunch of prior arrests, is that, you know, a sign that they really are a person who, who, is, who is prone to violence, who we might worry about as a public safety threat, or is it just a sign that they're the victim of racist harassment in their neighborhood, right? And that's not really a question you can answer. With, you know, you can't answer that with a machine learning algorithm. You need to like have some on the ground understanding of, of the generative forces that, that, that produce that feature. Okay, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, yeah, and so I guess like what you mentioned also, like you talked to a lot of domain experts now that you are applying this to the field, like uh, how have you found that they have contributed towards your work and how, what has that collaboration um, been like and why is it so important to not, to not just sort of be removed with the sort of like a throwing the data over the fence and then throwing the results back, like why is that collaboration important? Well, I just, I think in a lot of these fields, it's just like, it's impossible to do this work without domain experts. So let, let's just take medicine as an example, right? You know, we're, we've been trying to study some ICU data, if, sorry, um, intensive care unit data. And, you know, if you don't have a doctor on the ground, like you don't even know, you know, what like chemicals you should be looking at. Like what are doctors actually doing in actual clinical practice? You know, you, you don't know if you're trying to predict an outcome they actually care about. Like you're just totally, totally blind. And in some cases it's subtler, you know, the mistakes you, you make will be subtler. But in general, you know, you need domain experts both to sort of tell you what are the questions we actually care about. And secondly, you know, are you answering them in a rigorous way or are you like overlooking this thing, which, you know, it's not that you yourself are dumb, it's just that you're ignorant, right? It's like doctors go to med school for like four years and they like learn a lot of things and then they do a residency and you're not gonna be able to sort of a priori intuit that just cause you're like good at math, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, maybe this is obvious. <laughs> no, 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 I think, I think it's important, um, especially with the, like, you know, there, there's a lot of like, I think maybe at, I don't know how true this is, but like at, at the beginning, it seemed it seemed like, when, at least when I was first looking at it, there's a lot of like Kaggle competitions or sort of that kind of thing where all you get is the data. And while data is great, there is a lack of understanding of like what is actually going on and what are the underlying trends. So I can I can I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and even Kaggle, you know, I think is somewhat useful because often it's a curated section of tasks, right. right? Someone has put that on Kaggle for a reason because like it's useful to have a bunch of people throw an algorithm at it. Uh, so that that's some helpful guidance, but I still, you know, clinicians are, are invaluable as are, you know, I've worked with people in econ and law and sociology like all over the place. And let's put it this way. I have never regretted collaborating with a domain expert. Um, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, definitely. I took a machine learning for health care class last semester and uh, we got to work with pediatricians at the Boston Children's Hospital. And I think it is by far like the uh, like the most fruitful work that I've done just because of that, like sort of the back and forth and understanding how like, oh, there's also there's, there's like all these cool algorithms that are working on and all that. But um, like the level of expertise that they have is, is unmatched. Um, yeah, I think also it's kind of like fun. I mean, I don't know. I, I at least mostly enjoyed learning about other other fields, but you know, maybe that's less interesting to other people. But I mean, I like talk. I spent like an hour on the phone with a doctor last week talking about potassium. I don't know. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so sort of taking a turn. Um, first of all, congratulations on your new faculty position at Cornell. Thank you. Um, I guess like what do you envision your lab working on and what does that trajectory look like? Yeah, um, I mean, I intend to keep doing the kind of work I'm doing. So it's sort of at the intersection of machine learning, healthcare and inequality, you know, sort of draw some Venn diagram if you can call a Venn diagram if it has three circles. Um, and 
you know, so, so recently a lot of my work has been on COVID. Um, and, you know, I anticipate that may be a, a challenge into the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Um, you know, COVID is something where it hits all three of those things, right? Um, you know, there's enormous inequalities in the impact. It's obviously in the healthcare space, and oftentimes you need advanced computational modeling in order to deal with it. So most recently, we've been studying basically how disparities in movement patterns um, produce inequality uh, in COVID infection rates. So for example, some groups like lower socioeconomic status groups have to go out more, and in turn, they're more liable to infections. That's the kind of thing where you want to deal with large mobility data sets, you need uh, you know, computational techniques as well. So I, and you know, in general, society has so many problems at sort of the intersection of inequality and healthcare that new things just keep coming down the pike. So we'll just see what the new disaster in 2021 will be. Sorry, yeah. that, was, that was not an optimistic way to put it. I am optimistic about the future. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, like, there's been so many articles that say, you know, like COVID only sort of exasperates the existing issues that are already there. And I think um, what you're saying really, really sort of hits that point um, that, you know, whatever inequalities already exist is just, just made it worse. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like sort of along that line, I guess like um, alongside COVID, um, what projects, you know, are exciting you the most? Are you um, like COVID is obviously like the most uh, maybe like relevant one right now because it's such a large problem, but in the future, what other things are you hoping to work on? Yeah, one thing I haven't gotten to work on at all, and which has always been upsetting to me, um, is, is domestic violence just because it's so astonishingly prevalent. Um, and uh, for some reason, it's just, it's just always been viscerally upsetting to me. And so that is a, a project, a problem I'd really like to get a chance to work on. I think it's a little unclear to me exactly what the angle is from a machine learning or a computational standpoint. Um, you could imagine, for example, there are apps um, designed for domestic violence survivors to try and give them uh, pathways to safety. So you could imagine studying data from that kind of app, obviously with suitable privacy protections. Um, there are other, you know, digital data sources like Callisto, which are designed to sort of aggregate um, accusations in order to try and catch bad actors more quickly. So I think that's another interesting direction. There's thoughts of trying to predict from electronic health record data, can we sort of catch um, undiagnosed cases of domestic violence and potentially catch them earlier if doctors aren't aware of them. So that's a broad problem space I'm very interested in. It's a little unclear to me where can I be most useful. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that does make sense. And you know, the fields that you work on are, uh, they are very broad in many senses, right? Like there are, there, there's a lot to be looked into. So I guess like, what is your process of choosing you know, where you would be most useful or like what is the area that you in particular think that ML could have the most impact? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, and, you know, my track record is not, you know, is not perfect. It's very, it's very sort of hard to predict a priori what things will pan out. Um, but, you know, it has to satisfy a couple of criteria. Um, it has to be a problem of immediate sort of practical real world impact. Like I don't, I don't tend to work on stuff which is only gonna be useful like 60 years down the pike. Even like, I'm not saying no one should work on that. It's just not what I do. Um, and generally, you know, I'll look for a domain expert who's saying like, yeah, we actually need to solve this. Um, I look for stuff where a machine learning person is at, or you know, machine learning or statistics person is actually necessary. So like if you can solve it using Excel, it's probably not. Um, what I'm going to work on just because you don't, you don't need me. Um, you know, what are, I, I don't know, I look for stuff which is sort of emotionally compelling to me for whatever reason, which I realize is a weird, weird heuristic, but, um, but, but I think it helps to work on stuff which you're sort of personally invested in. It makes you work harder. Um, and so that's another criterion I use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, that definitely makes sense, right? Like you want to work on something that you'd be fine with working on multiple years down the line um yeah that you're still excited about so yeah and you know i think that that <laughs> heuristic makes a lot of sense um yeah okay so taking sort of another turn but um you do really really cool work and on um, scientific writing and blogging um on your website as well as other spaces 
science. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit more about like why you like scientific writing and how does your writing for the broad public change relative to like more academic journal type of writing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons I like to do scientific writing. Um, one is that there are a lot of pieces where, you know, you, you want to put it in the Washington Post. You don't want to put it in a journal because, you know, you're trying to reach policymakers or something, and they're not going to read like a 43 academic page academic paper on Bayesian inference, right? They want to read the TLDR. Um, and, and so you reach a different audience. Um, so I like that. Um, I, you know, I, I think academic publication can be a little exhausting in that like you spend like three years writing a paper and then like six people read it. Uh, and, and in contrast, you know, the time cycles of non-academic publication are much shorter. Uh, typically it's less work. And that, you know, that is a nice rewarding break because especially then like, you know, non-academics will like reach out to you. They'll email you and be like, I read your article, it meant something to me. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a nice thing. Uh, that's a, you know, I like helping people and that, that feels sort of personally rewarding. And I think, you know, relatedly, it sort of expands the sphere of people um, who can be interested in science and understand science. And so it sort of makes this a more, you know, it, it just diversifies the audience that we can reach. And that's appealing to me. Um, in terms of how it differs from academic writing, I mean, you know, you're, it's not quite a, a different language, but certainly you're, you're approaching it in a qualitatively different way, right? You can be much more colloquial, you can be more funny, you can be more intimate, you can be more personal, like you, you can never put like a personal anecdote about your life in an academic paper, right? You, you just, it's just not really done. Uh, but you can do that in an essay, right? You can start with a personal anecdote, and then you can sort of generalize. So that's, you're given more freedom in that regard, but you're also given less freedom in other regards. You can't have a 43 page supplement going into the mathematical details, no one's going to read that, um, even on a site like 538 you know, they'll give you some footnotes, but they're not, you just, you really can't go into detail at the same level. And also, you know, you got to get to the point quicker and you have to use non-technical language. And so there's sort of this tension between uh, keeping your reader's interest, but also not lying to them, right? You want to be sort of precise, but you also can't be technical. And so being, te you know, being precise without being technical and, and realizing like when it's okay to be a little hand wavy, uh, that's a tricky thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially as you know, there's a lot of um, not, not anti-science sentiment, but there is some pushback against, you know, scientific language um, nowadays with like the masks and like COVID in general, I guess, <laughs> and um, climate change. Um, you know, scientific communication is more important than ever. Um, and you were talking about like reaching policymakers. And so I guess like what has been your approach to that and what do you think like scientific writers can do better to inform the public and inform policymakers as to like how the work that researchers and other people are doing can be used for public good? Yeah, I mean, my approach has always just been like, if you have a finding that you think is a broad public interest, then write about it in the, in the highest profile public you know, whatever newspaper that is willing to publish your work. Um, one thing I have no experience with, and which I would like to explore more is like, well, can you get direct connections with policymakers? Because I'm like, you know, they're listening to you because they're on the phone. Um, and, you know, I think that's one thing which is exciting to me um, about working at Cornell. Like, I'm, I'm actually working on the New York City campus. And so you're like right in the middle of the city. And there's like all this, you know, nonprofits and, and government organizations and so on. And so you're, you're very close to these people. And conceivably, you could talk to them directly and, and be more directly translational in that regard. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I hope, I hope, you know, they'll start listening to some of the work that you're doing and we'll be able to see some measurable changes in that area. I hope so. um, yeah. Okay. So taking sort of maybe our, like our last turn, but it's for students who are interested in learning more about machine learning and pursuing work in the field. Do you have any thoughts about where should it, students should start? Like, should they start with maybe the more mathematical foundations on the theory side or begin with like an applied project or something on Kaggle and like fill in the gaps? Or do you think it's like a combination of both? Yeah, I mean, I can say it worked for me. I don't know how much it generalizes. Um, I think both theory and applied side are useful. I mean, I think the way I did it basically was I took a fair number of theory classes and sort of learned, you know, the theoretical aspects of, of machine learning. Um, but then concurrently, I worked in research labs on projects which, 
they weren't always purely applied, but they started with a very concrete applied motivation. It was like, this is a supply problem. We're trying to solve this. And sure, maybe we'll do some fancy math to try to solve it, but it was very concretely motivated in a practical application. And that, that's how I like to work because then you can be sure you're solving real problems. I think both taking classes and learning the theory uh, is useful and do, working in research labs is useful. I do think you should take some classes probably before you start doing research because otherwise you just like, won't know anything and you won't be able to work on interesting stuff and you might get sort of saddled with like really boring tasks that you don't actually want to be doing. Um, and so, I don't know, perhaps relatedly, I'm learning to play StarCraft now and uh, you can't just like learn to play StarCraft by playing pure StarCraft. You also have to like read StarCraft theory. And this is, you know, I was a tournament chess player in high school. Like you can't learn to play chess just by playing chess. You have to like read a little bit about chess or you like won't it takes too long to explore and like figure things out. Like classes actually are useful. You should pay attention in them. Yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. They are <laughs> useful. Um, sort of along the lines of like your own personal experience, like how did you personally get into machine learning and data science and why did it interest you? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I came into, I went to a math science high school. I was always a math nerd. Um, came into Stanford, though, being interested in physics, not in computer science, I actually thought I wasn't very good at computer science because I took a class uh, where I was the only girl and the boys in the class like made fun of me because I like had much less experience than they did. So I was like, okay, well, clearly I'm not good at this. I should just study physics. Um, but then, you know, I, I did take another class at Stanford on a whim in CS and I was like, oh, wow, this is like super cool. Uh, and, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. You know, I guess I, I was I was always a math nerd and I liked that CS gave you the ability to solve real problems. Um, it was appealing to me because I felt like physics, I, you know, I was studying galaxies, I was studying particles, and I wanted to be studying people. Um, and, and that, you know. Yeah, um, I went through a very similar trajectory where I started off in college thinking I was going to be a physics major. And then after taking uh, I think like my first algorithms class I was like never mind <laughs> I'm, like, yeah. I'm gonna do this <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I feel like there are a lot of uh physics to CS transplants I mean I do think physics is really useful because it does you know it makes you good at math you know like anything I learned know about like PDEs I learned from physics or something not that I really use that many PDEs that's kind of like but, you know yeah yeah no definitely and sort of like um sort of as a wrap up question, but I think it'll be very helpful for people. But it's like, what is your advice for uh, younger students who are sort of entering this field or wanting to work in it um, more broadly to machine learning, but also to the kinds of um, domains that you're working in? Because I think, you know, they're, they're places where a lot of great work can be done. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess I've already given some technical advice on how to like learn, learn things. Um, I guess a general piece of advice I'd have in terms of the people you work with is like brilliance is cheap in academia, academia. You know, there are a ton of brilliant people. I think try and work with people who are nice, um, who are going to be personally invested in your development, who are not just famous, but really want you to learn. Um, that was super important uh, for me. You know, I would never have gone to grad school if I hadn't you know, worked with people who were very personally invested in like, oh, here's this undergrad and we're going to make sure she's actually learning and she's actually happy here. Um, that's not something to be taken for granted. It's not ubiquitous and that's really important. And I would say conversely, you know, be kind yourself to people, you know, try and make them feel like they have a right to be in the room. Um, you know, don't, don't discount people, try and try and be kind to them. And I think, you know, that's not just the right thing to do. It will also be professionally useful to you because people will keep wanting to work with you, you know, um, and, and I think in general, we should, we should try and foster that culture. So that's, that's sort of a non-technical piece of advice. I'd have. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that's really good advice. I think it's, I think it's very relevant to a lot of people in academia, especially younger students especially you know women as, as you mentioned like you're the only um girl in your class and you know maybe maybe you would have felt less discouraged about computer science at the beginning if there was someone there to sort of make you feel make you feel welcome so oh absolutely yeah. and i you know i should say for what it's worth is that you know i continued in computer science because there were people who were like you should keep doing this you are you are good at this you should keep doing this and like that's like super important like i remember those conversations verbatim um yeah it matters yeah yeah definitely um so that was our last question i think Wonderful. for the interview thank you so much